Hello and welcome to Insight Ophthalmology. This is Dr. Amrit welcoming you to a lecture series on glaucoma. Today we are studying optic disc evaluation in glaucoma. That is the fundus changes in glaucoma made super easy. So without any delay, let's get started. So first we have to understand the definition of glaucoma. Glaucoma is defined as a heterogeneous group of disorders which will manifest as chronic progressive optic neuropathy, right? So this is the first thing that you have to remember that glaucoma is nothing but it is chronic, it is progressive and it is optic neuropathy. It is characterized by certain specific morphological changes which occur at the optic nerve head and also in the retinal nerve fiber layer and finally the end result is the loss of retinal ganglion cells right so first thing you remember it is a chronic progressive optic neuropathy second it is characterized by the morphological changes where at the optic nerve head and in the retinal nerve fiber layer and the final common loss which occurs is the loss of the retinal ganglion cell ultimately this loss of the retinal ganglion cell will lead to the loss of the visual fields so under uh, whenever we are studying the fundus in case of glaucoma we have to see basically three types of changes in the fundus these are number one the changes which occur at the disc okay or in the morphology of the disc number two the changes which occur in the vessels which are present on the disc and these are called the vascular changes and number three is the peripapillary changes that is the changes which occur in the retina which is surrounding the disc okay so that is called peripapillary changes before going into the disc changes we should know that we should have a basic knowledge about the anatomy of the optic nerve head now if you're not sure about the anatomy of the optic nerve head i would suggest that you visit my video on the anatomy of the optic nerve so as we all know that the optic nerve is nothing but it is a collection of the neurons which are coming from the ganglion cell layer as the nerve fiber layer so all the nerve fiber layer axons are going to coincide at the optic disc and pass through the lamina cribrosa and then they are going to form the optic nerve so our optic nerve is actually consisting of the neurons and along with the neurons there are also certain supporting structure which is nothing but the glial tissue the glial tissue is nothing but it is the fibrous tissue and therefore it is also called the supportive tissue which is actually supporting the axons which are passing through the lamina fibrosa so there are certain named uh, glial tissue which is present so first is the ilm of the elschnig and, and the cunt tissue so what is it basically the internal limiting membrane of the retina when it comes towards the optic disc it is called the internal limiting membrane of elschnig and near the center it is actually dipping a little and forming a meniscus and therefore it is called the cunt's meniscus now similarly the support tissue is also present at the border of the optic nerve and this is called the border tissue of jacobi intermediary tissue of cunt and the border tissue of elschnig now why uh, is it important to know about this fibrous or glial tissue is that because in glaucoma what happens is the nerves are going to get degenerated that is the ganglion cells are going to get degenerated and ultimately we are going to be left with this glial tissue okay that is the cunt's jacobi and the elschnig's so this is a cross section of the lamina fibrosa and uh, just have a look at this cross section so lamina fibrosa is nothing but it is a fenestrated sclera right so sclera at the level of the optic disc actually has lots of fenestration as can be seen and the sieve like structure is called a lamina fibrosa now what i want you to observe is that the pores which are present superiorly and the pores which are present inferiorly they are much bigger compared to the pores which are present nasally and temporally right so these are much bigger pores right so superiorly and inferiorly we have bigger pores so what does it mean it means that if the pores are bigger what does it mean that means the glial tissue or the support is less superiorly and inferiorly right because ultimately if the neurons are present in between them we have this glial tissue and this glial tissue is only forming this uh, sieve like structure lamina fibrosa 
so if the sieves or the pores are bigger it means that the glial tissue is less superiorly and inferiorly and since the glial tissue is less superiorly and inferiorly the support is also less superiorly and inferiorly and therefore the glochomatous changes also occur more frequently at the superior poles and also at the inferior poles the susceptibility to damage is more in superior poles and in the inferior poles why because the pores are bigger the support tissue is less and therefore the damage the susceptibility to damage is more at the superior poles and the inferior poles of the optic disc and that therefore superior and inferior poles are affected first now let us uh, uh, talk about the elchnick scleral ring now this yellow color structure that you can see in between these arrows is nothing but it's actually forming a ring around the optic disc and this is called the scleral ring of elchnick and it marks the border of the optic disc right so the optic disc will actually start from the inner lip of the uh, scleral ring so this if this is the scleral ring which is seen over here as yellowish from the inner lip you have to measure the optic disc right so that's the importance of the elchnick scleral ring which forms the boundary of the optic disc now with this basic knowledge of the anatomy of the optic disc now let us study about the first disc change and for that we should know about the normal size of the disc so how do we measure the size of the disc the disc size can actually be measured using the graticule of a slit lamp so this is a slit lamp and over here we have a, a knob which is called the graticule of the slit lamp and the readings on the graticule will come over here right so with this graticule we can get a long slit like this as shown in this picture and this slit can then be made shorter according to the optic disc size and we can measure actually the optic disc size both horizontally and vertically using a horizontal slit and a vertical slit on the slit lamp using the graticule function of the slit lamp and we have to simultaneously do an indirect ophthalmoscopy using the volk lens so the average vertical diameter of our optic disc is about 1.8 mm and the horizontal diameter is about 1.7 mm so since the vertical diameter is more than the horizontal diameter normal optic disc is vertically oval so as i told you that we can uh, check the size of the disc using the slit lamp graticule function and we can use the volk lens and uh, we can measure uh, we have to take a slit lamp beam and put it on the disc and then we have to measure the length of the slit lamp beam basically on the graticule okay so once we know the reading on the graticule then we have to multiply it with the correction factor so that correction factor is different for various types of lenses that we use so the most common lens that we use for the optic disc evaluation is a 78 diopter lens and therefore the correction function that we use is about 1.1 so what i mean to say is that suppose you get 2 mm on the graticule you have to multiply it with 1.1 okay now suppose you get uh, about 1.8 mm on the graticule function of the slit lamp again you will multiply it with 1.1 if you have seen the optic disc using the 90 diopter volk lens okay yeah so based on the size of the disc and the diameter of the disc we can call the disc as small disc if the diameter is less than 1.5 millimeters and it can, it is also called the large disc if the diameter is more than 2.2 millimeters and then there are average or the medium sized disc now suppose we do not have a slit lamp available the size of the optic disc can also be determined approximately using the direct direct ophthalmoscope okay and in particular if you take the welsh allen ophthalmoscope okay and we have to take a spotlight from the uh, direct ophthalmoscope and usually the spot uh, will be like this 
shown over here and uh, this spot aperture the size of the aperture would be about 5 degrees now so if you do not have an aperture size and in some as in some ophthalmoscopes we actually get three uh, spot sizes a small medium and a large spot size we should actually choose the medium aperture size in order to obtain a rough estimate of the uh, disc size so let us see how do we use this uh, spot size so this is the spot that we get from the direct ophthalmoscope and now we are going to do our direct ophthalmoscopy and project this spot directly onto the disc of the patient. Now in a case of a patient who has a medium sized disc what happens is that this spot will directly approximate with the disc which is of medium size right. So that means the spot size is going to be equal to the size of an average or a normal disc. However, when you move the spot size and you see that some part of the disc is not coinciding with the margin of the spot, it means that the disc is a larger disc. Uh, and similarly, sometimes if you put it on a disc and you see that the entire disc is actually present within the confinement of the spot and also some part of retina is included, it means that our disc is smaller than our spot size and therefore we are dealing with a small disc. So this is how using the spot of the direct ophthalmoscope, we can determine the size of the disc as small, medium and large. Next, let us talk about the shape of the disc. Just as human beings, disc also comes in various shapes and sizes. A disc can be a perfectly round disc or it can be a horizontally oval disc or it could be a vertical oval disc or it could be a tilted disc as in myopes or it could be an irregularly shaped disc. Now let us talk about the arrangement of the fibers at the disc and also at the optic nerve. Understanding this is very important to understand the changes on the retina and the disc in glaucoma. Now as you can see the fibers directly from the macula and the foveal region are going to come straight away to the optic disc and straight away to the temporal part of the optic disc as the papillomacular bundle. The superior arcade fibers are going to carry the fibers from the superior temporal retina and the inferior arcade fibers are carrying the fibers from the inferior temporal retina and they are getting inserted into the superior part of the disc and the superior temporal part of the disc and the inferior arcade fibers are getting inserted into the inferior part of the disc and the inferior temporal part of the disc. Similarly, from the nasal side, we have the superior radiating fibers and the inferior radiating fibers which are getting inserted into the uh, nasal part of the disc superiorly and temporally, superiorly and inferiorly respectively. Now, usually the inferior arcade fibers are uh, more susceptible to damage and therefore we usually find an inferior notch and uh, inferior retinal nerve fiber uh, defect more commonly. Similarly, this is this picture over here depicts the arrangement of the nerve fibers in the optic disc. You can see that the fibers which are present close to the optic nerve are present more centrally in the optic nerve. Whereas the fibers which are coming from the periphery of the retina, they are located in the periphery of the optic nerve. Right. So this is also important that the fibers which are located here, they are more central and the peripheral fibers of the retina are more peripheral in the optic nerve. Next, after we have learned about the size and shape of the disc, what is uh, next more important thing is the neuroretinal rim and the neuroretinal rim thickness. So let me tell you what is meant by neuroretinal rim. If this is the rim of the, the outer boundary of the disc which is marked by the Elschnig ring and inside what we see is the cup of the disc. Now the area which is present between the cup and the disc is the neuroretinal rim. Okay, and it is the thickness of the neuroretinal rim which is important in the diagnosis of the retina. So for studying the neuroretinal rim thickness, we have an important rule which is called the ISNT rule or the ISNT rule. 
In the ISNT rule, it says that the inferior rim is the thickest rim followed by the superior rim followed by the nasal rim and in the end we have the temporal rim which is the thinnest right so this is called the isn't rule so isn't rule so in a normal disc as shown over here the inferior is the thickest after that the superior is the thickest after that the nasal and then the temporal rim is the thinnest rim so based on that we can see that the superior and the inferior rims are the thicker rims and the nasal and the temporal rims are the thinner rims and therefore the cup is actually horizontally oval it's not a perfect uh, circle in shape so what did i tell you because the vertical diameter of the disc is more compared to the horizontal diameter a normal disc is actually vertically oval however since according to the isn't rule the inferior and the superior rims are more thicker the cup a normal cup is a horizontal oval cup so whenever this relationship between the cup and the disc is lost then we have to suspect a glaucoma so what i mean to say is that this horizontally oval cup in glaucoma might become a vertically oval cup so whenever you see a vertically oval cup we have to suspect glaucoma now let us understand the concept of cupping so in this picture you can see that this is the normal disc and in this disc you can see this is the normal neuroretinal rim the normal retinal nerve fiber layer and this is the normal cup okay this is the normal cup and these are the normal lamina cribrosa now what happens in glaucoma is that there will be thinning of the retinal nerve fiber layer and because of the thinning there will be thinning of the neuroretinal rim and because of that there will be retinal ganglion cell loss and only the fibrous tissue is there now and because of that there will be more and more posterior bending of the uh, of the lamina cribrosa which you can see over here it is more more posteriorly and outwardly bending because of which what we see is the enlargement of this cup of the disc and this is called cupping okay so this is called cupping which is seen in glaucoma so cupping can be basically of two types that is shallow cupping versus deep cupping as you can see over here in the first picture in this there is cupping but it is not very obvious to our eyes and this type of cupping is called a shallow cupping and in the shallow cupping the bending uh, back of the lamina cribrosa is only up to the prelaminar portion of the optic disc however in a case of deep cupping as seen over here the cupping is more deeper more excavated and the pathology will go and reach the lamina cribrosa also and in such cups you will have you will see the lamina uh, dots lamina seen as dots because of the deep cup and this is called the laminar dot sign okay this is called lamina dots dot sign so the difference between shallow cupping and deep cupping is nothing but the anatomy and the level up to which the cupping has occurred if it if it is just above the level of lamina cribrosa that is pre laminar it is called shallow cupping and if it is deeper up to the laminar area it is called deep cupping so again this picture shows the clinically shallow cupping and this is the deep cupping which you can see extending up to the lamina cribrosa and the shallow one is only up to the prelaminar region now the cuppings can actually happen in various patterns either you can have a concentric neuroretinal rim loss and then you can have a concentric cupping in which you can see that the neuroretinal rim has actually thinned out in all the areas equally and therefore you have a circular cup but there is a deep cupping right so that is called concentric cupping however sometimes you might just have a cupping with a one area of focal loss of neuroretinal rim which will lead to notching at one place so this is called cupping with unipolar notch called cupping with unipolar notch because there's a focal loss of the neuroretinal rim similarly sometimes there can be loss of neuroretinal rims at two places that means at two poles and this is called a bipolar 
notching right so you can see in the unipolar notch and even in the bipolar notch we can see that it's both it's mostly involving the superior and the inferior poles because they are more susceptible compared to the nasal and temporal po uh, temporal parts of the neuroretinal rim and i already explained to you why they are more susceptible so this picture over here shows the thinning of the neuroretinal rim so as i told you that a normal uh, disc is a vertically oval and with a horizontally oval cup and over here we can see that the cup has become more circular that means there has been a pathology going on and this is actually thinning of the neuroretinal rim the isn't rule is not is it is not being followed over here actually you can see that the superior uh, rim and the inferior rim are actually looking equal right but according to the isn't rule the inferior rim should be the thickest and then the superior and then the nasal so this means that there is a thinning of the inferior rim and as such more of the uh, you can see this thinning of the nasal rim also and, and superior rim also so this is actually a concentric thinning of the rim now look at this focal loss of the neuroretinal rim over here so this is the margins of the vessels so this is the rim and over here you can see the rim is actually dipping and at this area there is a focal neuroretinal rim loss and this is called notching of the rim so now let us talk about what is meant by saucerization in a normal uh, disc as shown over here this one you can see that this is the disc this is the neurotinal rim and then in the center we have the cup the cup is usually paler compared pale compared to the neurotinal rim and the reason is that that we have more glial tissue present in the cup area that is the glial tissue of kunt and elschnix as i told you now because there's more glial tissue it looks more whiter or pale in color whereas the neurotinal rim because it has blood vessels along with the uh, nerves nerves uh, fibro nerve fibers therefore it is more reddish or pinkish in color now as glaucoma occurs there will be increased in this cup uh, size and as the cup increases the central pallor is also going to increase however in certain cases what happens is that this shallow in case of especially in case of shallow cupping what happens is that the cup is going to extend up to the disc margin as shown over here however the central pallor is going to be retained only in the central region and the central pallor is not going to follow the cupping so what happens is that we are going to get fooled as if that this is the normal cup because the central pallor is limited to this central area and the remaining area over here will look normal pinkish in region right so this is the concept of saucerization saucers are nothing but they are shallow plates and therefore saucerization means number 1 it means shallow cupping shallow cupping extending up to the disc margin as it extends the central pallor however does not follow the shallow cupping and it remains in the center as can be seen so this uh, so how do we differentiate where exactly is the normal cupping is based upon the vessels as you can see the vessels are actually coming out from this region that means the real cup is like this so this is the real cup and the paler of the rim the paler of the cup is only limited to this area and such a disc in which we can get fooled by the central pallor which is not following the disc cupping is called the saucerization of the disc and why does saucerization occur the saucerization occur because of shallow cupping or gradual cupping and along that gradual cupping based on the vessels contour we have to identify where exactly is the cup present similarly we can see this picture over here that there is a cupping which is seen and we might feel that okay fine this is the cup because the central pallor is still here however if you have a look at the vessels the vessels are actually coming out here and the vessels are coming out here that means that the real cup 
cupping is up to here and if we would have considered just the central pallor in deciding the cup morphology and the cup boundary we would have been fooled and we would have missed actually this extra part of cupping and this process or this these types of cups are called saucerization okay such type of cupping is called saucerization now let us talk about what is meant by bean pot cupping so bean pot cupping is nothing but it occurs in the very progressed glaucomas in this eventual loss of all the neural rim tissue will occur and there will be a total cupping characterized by total white disc with bending of all the vessels at the disc margin right so almost all the vessels are going to uh, get bent so if you see a cross section in bean, bean, uh, in bean pod cupping we will have extreme posterior displacement of the lamina cribrosa undermining of the disc margin so this is a bean pod and you can see there's an extreme posterior bending and in this disc as if you see there is a bean pot cupping and almost the entire neuroretinal rim is lost and therefore we do not see any neuroretinal rim okay so we do not have any neuroretinal rim however we are just having vessels which are coming and then they are uh, taking a sharp bend so everywhere the vessels are actually bending sharply so what happens is that the vessels are going to come like this and then they don't have a neuroretinal rim to travel so they're just going to come out like this okay so there will be bends at all the places in the vessels and there will be almost no uh, there will be almost no neuroretinal rim now let us talk about pallor versus cupping so in a normal disc the neuroretinal rim will be more pinkish in color and the cup will be more pale in color right however in case of uh, uh, so what happens sometimes is that we are going to get a pale optic disc now in a pale optic disc like this okay we always have to think about non glaucomatous optic neuropathy because in a case of glaucoma usually the neuroretinal rim will not be pale it is mostly the cupping which is more compared to the pallor however whenever we are talking about neurological rims or neurological disc okay in that case like aion and arthritic and non arthritic aion in those cases it is the disc pallor which is more prominent than cupping that means whenever you see a cupping you have to think in terms of glaucoma and when you think when you see pale discs then you have to think in terms of neurological conditions now let us talk about the cup disc ratio so in the case of cup disc ratio usually it is the vertical cup disc ratio which is more important compared to the horizontal cup disc ratio and uh, cup disc ratio i actually speaking they are not very useful because the small disc are usually going to have small cups with the median cd ratio of about 0.3 and large disc usually have large cups with a median cd ratio of about 0.5 so if you consider an, an average disc and uh, in that if the cup disc ratio is more than 0.7 there are a lot of chances that this disc is actually glaucomatous because only 2% of the population have a cdr of more than 0.7 now because there's a lot of variability in the size of the cup and the cup disc ratio based upon the size of the disc that means the small disc have small cups and the large disc will have large cup so in therefore what we have now is a disc damage likelihood scale right so in which we are actually carrying uh, we are actually calculating the rim diameter and dividing it with the disc diameter and based on that we will find out what is a normal disc at risk disc glaucomatous uh, damage risk and a glaucomatous disability risk now the next thing which is important with respect to cdr is asymmetrical cup disc ratio that means in a patient if two eyes are having asymmetry in their cups and disc ratio then it should raise a suspicion of glaucoma and usually an asymmetry of about 0.2 or more is actually considered now let, uh, let us have a look at this disc now this disc over here might be about 0.6 and over here might be about 0.8 to 0.9 cup disc ratio and you can see that the difference is about 0.2 to 0.3 and therefore there is a strong suspicion of glaucoma 
now let us talk about the vessel changes in glaucoma so normally the vessels are going to come like this the central retinal artery and then they are going to travel in this way dividing into the various arcades but in glaucoma what happens is that because of the posterior bending of the lamina cribrosa these vessels are now going to have a different course because there is a cup present over here so instead of traveling either they can travel straight but instead of traveling straight now they have to travel along this changed contour of the cup like this and as they are traveling along this in a different path different types of vessel changes will occur now the first type of change uh, which can occur in glaucoma is the extreme nasalization of the vessels so in this picture as you can see that the main trunk usually can be central or it is slightly nasal but in this case you can see that almost it is near the margin the central trunk and from there the arcades are dividing so this is called nasalization of the vessel however this is a non specific sign for glaucoma so nasalization of vessel alone cannot predict that a patient will have have glaucoma next what we have is the bio netting so bio netting is a sign which is related to the local thinning of the neuroretinal rim tissue okay and so what happens is as there's a local thinning of the neuroretinal rim there will be a sharpening of the rim which is produced as seen over here this rim is more sharpened because of the thinning now if the vessel has to cross cross this sharpened rim it has to bend sharply at the edge of the uh, disc and therefore it will create what is called a bionetting at the disc edge so a bionet is nothing but a weapon like this and you can see its sharp edge like this and the vessels also are going to take a similar a similar kind of course so what i mean to say is if this was the normal optic disc and the optic cup now because of cupping and extreme focal loss as suppose here the vessel is now going to come like this and take a sharp bend and come outside so it is going to look like a bionet and this is called bionetting at the disc margin you can see this vessel over here it is coming like this and then taking a sharp bend at the area of local thinning of the neural rib now let us talk about the bearing of the circumlinear vessels the circumlinear vessel as the name suggests they are actually the branches of the central retinal artery and after coming out from the central retinal artery they are going to actually track along the neuroretinal rim circumlinearly now because they are going circumferentially around the rim they are called the circumlinear vessels now they are actually going to go along the neuroretinal rim and when in glaucoma there is erosion of the neuroretinal rim what happens is that these vessels are now going to be left bare or isolated from the margin of the cup so these vessels are now just would be naked hanging in the cup and this is called bearing of the circumlinear vessel as shown over here so originally the vessel was this vessel which is shown here originally it was traveling like this but because the uh, because of the receding of the uh, cup and receding of this margin of the rim now the vessel is actually hanging however sometimes what happens is that the vessels instead are, are going to bridge across this deep cup and that is called overpassing now this well, slide over here depicts overpassing of this vessel that is here as you can see and even this vessel which is overpassing so what happens is that if this is the cup the vessels were actually supposed to pass along the cup and then come out however these vessels however choose to pass on top of it like this and since there's an empty pit or the empty cup beneath them and it will look as if the vessels are bridging that cup or a pit or an excavated cup and therefore it is called overpassing now the next sign what we have is a lamina dot sign which is nothing but when there is a continuous deepening of the cup it will expose the underlying lamina cribrosa which are the sieve like structure and they will look like dots and gray dots in the lamina and it is a sign of progressive glaucoma now after the vascular changes let us talk about the peripapillary changes which occur in glaucoma these can be divided into the peripapillary hemorrhage the retinal nerve fiber bundle defects or the retinal nerve fiber layer defects the peripapillary pigmented changes first let us talk about the optic disc hemorrhages also referred to as the splinter hemorrhages 
and also called as the Drans hemorrhages. Now these hemorrhages are very specific to glaucoma and uh, they are especially seen in normal tension glaucoma more commonly than the primary open angle glaucoma. So these single, uh, single hemorrhages they will actually cross the disc margins like this and they are going to look like a flame shape usually and what happens is that once they start resolving the portion which is present near the disc that is a papillary portion will disappear first compared to this part that is the extra papillary region so this can be uh, the picture shows over here the presence of a superior hemorrhage or the disc hemorrhage and the same thing can be seen over here right and one more important thing to know is that whenever there's a hemorrhage you have to look for two things always find a notch over that area and always try to localize the retinal nerve fiber layer loss in that area because usually this these three will coexist together presence of a hemorrhage presence of a notch and presence of a retinal nerve fiber uh, layer loss or defect now let us talk about the retinal nerve fiber layer defects Retinal nerve fiber layer defects usually will look as dark stripes or wedge shaped defects in the peripapillary region. If that is called a localized RNFL loss. Sometimes however in advanced glaucoma when there is a total glaucomatous optic atrophy there will be a diffuse loss of the retinal nerve fiber layer. And usually they are going to follow a disc hemorrhage and always should be correlated with the visual field effect and the lost uh, neural retinal rim tissue that is the notching. Now this picture over here shows a normal retinal nerve fiber layer okay and the retinal nerve fiber layer is always assessed in a red free filter or the black and white white images as shown over here right. So this is a normal healthy retinal nerve fiber layer. A normal healthy retinal nerve fiber layer would be actually very shiny and glossy okay and they will actually obscure the appearance of our vessels. So what I mean uh, to say is that the shininess of the normal retinal nerve fiber layer is so much that it will actually obscure our normal vessel. However, when there is a retinal nerve fiber layer defect, the vessel will become more clearer okay so that means in an area where the retinal nerve fiber layer gets lost the vessels will become more clearer and they will look more clear as can be seen over here this vessel is not that clear compare and compare it to this vessel here right so this vessel is looking more clearer and you can see a shadow like area a wedge shaped area and that is the area of retinal nerve fiber layer loss and since it's in a shape of a wedge it is called a wedge shaped defect the same thing you can compare on a red free filter and you can see this dark area over here with the prominence of the vessel appearance and this indicates that there is a retinal nerve fiber layer defect always follow that always remember that a notch usually follows a retinal nerve fiber layer defect so what happens is usually a hemorrhage comes first after a hemorrhage uh, a retinal nerve fiber layer uh, loss comes and then as the nerve fiber layers will be lost the rim is going to get thickened in that area and then we are going to develop a notch right so you can see over here this is the notch and subsequently over here we have an rnfl defect also similarly see over here we have a notch and this is the retinal nerve fiber layer defect here we have a bipolar notch and you can see the defects over here and even here we have the retinal nerve fiber layer defect in this picture we have the triad that means we have the retinal hemorrhage then we have a retinal nerve fiber layer defect and then we also have a notch now let us talk about the peripapillary atrophy zones right so the peripapillary atrophy zones are divided into the alpha zone and the beta zone right so you have to remember one point that the beta zone is always located inside the alpha zone the alpha zone can be hyperpigmented or hyperpigmented areas but they are not very important because they can be present in normal eyes also however the beta zone is more specific in relation to glaucoma and in the beta zone it is, it is mostly hyperpigmented because we have atrophy of the retinal pigment epithelium and the choriocapillaries in that area and uh, we will see large choroidal vessels so the capillaries are lost and the pigment epithelium is lost in the beta zone however the large choroidal vessels are going to be retained. 
so if you comp if you uh, look have a look at this normal disc okay so a normal disc and a glucomatous in a glucomatous disc we might have these zones this is called the beta zone you can see that the beta zone is present inside the alpha zone and usually the alpha zone is hyperpigmented and in the beta zone we have hypopigmentation because in that we have loss of the rpe and the choreo capillaries in this fundus picture you can see disc picture you can see that the alpha zone is present outside and this is the beta zone and this is the alpha zone and it is the presence of beta zone and the expansion of the beta zone which is more specific to the glaucoma now in the end let us summarize that based on the optic disc evaluation how can we talk about the progressive optic nerve head damage or progressive glaucoma the first thing is the changes in the neuroretinal uh, rim counter that means on the first visit suppose we see a focal notch and in the second visit that notch becomes bipolar and then if it becomes progressive thinning and then there's an increase in the cup disc ratio right so that is, that indicates there is progression similarly development and enlargement of the notch sometimes shift in the position of the blood vessel that means you are developing bearing of the blood vessels eventually then presence of disc hemorrhage especially if it is recurrent disc hemorrhage okay progressive changes in the retinal nerve fiber layer enlargement of the beta zone it is a beta zone which is important and development of a focal neuroretinal rim pallor right so here we're talking about focal nr nrr pallor and not the disc pallor as in general which is more common in the neurological or non glaucomatous causes so this was about the optic disc evaluation in glaucoma i hope it was useful thank you and have a nice day